Uh, Brent, let's walk through, you know, kind of six months after our first discussion that we've had. We've known each other for a long time. And, uh, it, you know, A, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked how, how much time you spend with uh, the trolls on the media. I have an assistant that anyone, just, you know, our, our fundamental belief is if anyone's disrespectful or rude, period, not just to me, but to industry, they just get blocked. You're out of our universe. Um, so, you know, let, let's cover, you know, I have money with you and, and I've watched how you've done. It's been incredible because such an asymmetric bet and this concept is so contrary. And yet, you know, yes, the market's gone uh, different than your theory, but hey, uh, uh, we're still up. We haven't lost any money. And let's let's talk about have you changed your thesis at all? I've not changed my thesis at all. Um, you know, I've gone into this and I've I've pretty consistently said, you know, going back a couple of years that this is a three or four year time horizon play. Uh that it's not gonna be easy and that even if we get it there's gonna be periods where we're gonna look really smart and there's gonna be periods where we look really stupid. Um and we looked really smart the first three months of the year and we don't look so smart the next four months of the year but nothing has really changed overall. Um, the underlying thesis is still there. Um, we are very confident that our positions that are positioned to pay off, you know, two to three years from now will do so. And not only that, but we think when those positions that we already have start to play out, they will create other opportunities. Um, you know, so I think anybody that thinks that we're going to get through the next two or three years in an easy fashion and that, you know, the Fed has everything under control, and that the dollar is just going to go down and to the right in a very easy and controlled manner and without any volatility along the way is just kidding themselves. And when, you know, when, when I think reality hits, uh, I think we're going to see a much different market than what we've seen. But if I'm wrong, we will be fine. We have a diversified portfolio. We don't suggest anybody put a huge percent of their portfolio into one strategy. Uh, you know, I, I always say that the, the best way to get rich is a concentrated portfolio and the best way to get rich, poor is a concentrated portfolio. Uh, if you've worked hard and you took a calculated risk at some point in your past and now you have a nice portfolio, unless you're trying to beat, uh, you know, Bill Gates or somebody in richest man in the world contest, you don't have to take those concentrated bets anymore. Or at least you don't have to take the concentrated bet with your whole portfolio. You can be uh, do the alligator investing like you. You can take concentrated bets with a portion of your portfolio that's intended to pay off over two, three, four, five years, uh, but you don't have to do it. Put your whole portfolio in one asset. And I think that over the next, call it just call it two to three years, um, that the opportunities um, to play the knock-on effects of a strengthening dollar are absolutely incredible. Uh, they almost warned that you ha they almost warned that you have to do the trade because the asymmetry is so large. If you're wrong, you don't lose a whole lot. If you're right, you have the opportunity to make a killing. And I, I love stuff like that. And, and that's the key. Like, you know, I've had so many guys going, oh, you know, the swap lines, they've been cut. I'm like, yeah, if you're looking from a month to month perspective, but look how much A, how much money has gone into the system. First of all, the digit creation. Number two, are we at it? Does anyone truly think we're out of the woods that the bankers have solved this problem? If you think so, then okay. Let's not talk about the positive swaps versus the negative swap line nations. Yeah. What's your take on that? Yeah, no, I mean, let's just look at things over the last, since the middle of June. Forget what happened in the first four months of the year. Forget what happened with the China-US trade deal over the last two years. Uh, in the middle of June, that started to break apart pretty quickly. And you can see a very steady ratcheting up of the pressure on China, or at least the um, the pressure between the U.S. and China. Uh, some will argue that China's pressure in the U.S. I would argue it's the other way. But you've seen a very steady progression of tactics and articles and pronouncements and announcements and intentions for more announcements steadily coming out of the State Department and the White House versus China. So we are on this path towards less globalization, not more globalization. And I, I think regardless of who wins in November uh, in the presidential election, that path towards uh, you know a G2 world where you've got China and their allies and the US and their allies, I think that's the path forward. And to think that behind the scenes when um, trade deals get done and when geopolitical treaties get signed, there's not uh, some push and shove behind the scenes 
And if, to think that, you know, access to dollar funding is not part of that in some way, I think is a little bit naive. So I expect that to play out dramatically over the next couple of years. You know, friends and allies will get access to dollar funding. Those who don't, won't. So, you know, 19 years ago, we had the, uh, you know, the terrorist attacks in New York. And one of the things that came out of that was the uh, Department of Homeland Security. And I'll, I'll never forget, you know, in the, I think it was the State of the Union after that. It might, it was either the State of the Union or it was just shortly after the attack where, um, you know, Bush went on TV and he said, listen, you're either with us or against us. Yeah. And I didn't really, I don't really like that. I don't really like that it's a bipolar world. I don't really like, uh, you know, having ultimatums put. And, you know, I can, I would argue that in some ways that has been bad for America, but it's reality. And that's the thing that I want to get across uh, to a lot of people is, it's one thing to invest for how you would like to see the world. And if you want to do that and you want to try to change the world, that's fine. But it's another thing to invest for how the world's actually going to be. And I think you kind of have to be kind of a stone cold realist when it comes to like geopolitics and stuff like this. Uh, the U.S., whatever you think of the U.S., whether you think of them as the bright, shining city on the hill or whether you think of them as the evil empire. The fact is that we are still the global superpower. The fact is we still have the biggest military fact is we still have the most influence around the world even if you argue that it's declining it is still we still have more influence than any other country around the world and that has practical realities for how all this plays out so the currency that's held by yeah. more than any other currency exactly so i think i think the idea that you, you just automatically sit back and bet against the united states is kind of a, a silly idea regardless I'm of what you think of them on a personal level so what about now mmt we, we talked about this six months ago we we both like Unless your thesis has changed, which I don't think it has, we talk all the time. MMT is here to stay, and it's just started. And I don't think people have really yeah. contemplated the impacts that this is going to have, and how far the central bankers are going to take this. Now that Powell had his early August speech, and he's rewritten the rules and the, and the framework to give the platform for whoever wins the election to go full throttle into stimulus. Uh, you know, you know, there used to be that drill, baby, drill. I think it's stimulate, baby, stimulate, right? Uh, so what's your take moving forward on MMT and, and, and just across the globe now? Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, I think I think it's fair to say austerity is dead. You know, that that was tried and it's not going to be tried again. Um, the governments are going to spend whatever they need to spend uh, to try to spin their way out of this now. You know, that's a whole other topic. Can you spend your way out of a hole? Um, I would argue that you can't, but that doesn't mean they're not going to try. Again, you know, let's talk about what you believe versus what's actually going to happen, right? Um, there's no question in my mind. The, the one thing that both Democrats and uh, Republicans can agree on is spending money, right? So, yeah. so once we get past the election, and regardless of who wins, I don't think it really matters. We're going to see a massive stimulus bill next year. We'll probably see a massive uh, infrastructure bill. Uh, and I think they're going to be bigger than anybody even thinks possible. Totally um, agree. And the the one thing I would say is for the let, let's talk about rates for a second. Let's talk about, because well, let's step back for a second, because there's the MMT argument. But what, one thing you got to remember is MMT is to a certain extent taking monetary policy out of the hands of the central bankers and giving it to the Treasury or the government. The central banker, you know, the, the other ways that for central bankers to control, you know, uh, monetary policy. Now, you can argue that they're going to merge. And that is kind of MMT when the Treasury and the central bank merge together. Yep. Um, but, you know, the, the central banks still have a role to play in this as well. And I think one of the popular themes that has come up over the last couple of years is that we've gotten to the zero bound. Europe and Japan even went negative. It didn't work. And so they're not going to try that anymore. And I would be very careful about making that assumption because when you make that assumption, you're thinking like a rational investor. <laughs> Central bankers are not rational investors. They don't look at it the same way an investor looks at it. They think they're thinking like an investor, but they don't think like an investor. They have their models and their models tell them what to do. And when you think about what Europe and Japan have done, you know, they went negative, but they only went a little bit negative. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying a little bit negative isn't a bad thing. Uh, I think it is a bad thing. But, you know, the reality is you could argue that with the rates there being slightly negative and us still being in deflation, to calculate real rate of turn, you take a negative rate minus the inflation rate. Well, right. if you're minusing a negative, you're actually adding, right? So 
if, 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 if rates are set only slightly negative and you're in deflation, real rates are still positive. It would not shock me at all to see the central bankers come out and say, we are not, not only are we not, not only are we, not only are we not forgetting about negative rates, we're taking them much more negative than we already have. Because our goal is now to have negative real rates, not True. just negative rates. And you know, it's funny, and, uh, I, I could not agree more. Last year, I wrote about this and I think it was June. And I talked, we're going to go lower for longer. And that's the only solution that these central bankers are going to apply here now for exactly what you're talking about. And with convexity, you had the, uh, the, the bond prices just skyrocket and the market right. liked it because the bond managers are getting paid more, right? So it's this whole self-fulfilling prophecy. And then you push the limit of going lower and lower. And so you get less. And, and that's, I don't see that changing either. And I think over the next few years, we're going to see that. So is that your time frame also? Yeah, I mean, it kind of all plays together. And what I, again, I won't be shocked if they don't think to, I, that the, if they don't take them more negative, but I'm just saying that for the people who've dismissed it and say they're not going to do it anymore because it hasn't worked, I, I think that's the wrong way to think about it. I think you have to, and, and the people that say the central banks are out of bullets, I think, come on, guys, the, these guys are the greatest magicians in history. They've got more tricks than anybody. Well, and, to think that the, and to think that they can't do anything else, I think, is completely wrong. Again, I don't necessarily like this. It's just reality. But they're also going to put, you know, like in Canada, I, I expect fully them to bring a tax on cash, a tax on assets. Sure. And that all plays into what we're talking about. These are yeah. significant deflationary pressures, right? It's reaction to deflation. You don't do that if it's Absolutely. not like, trying to fight deflation. Well, so now, that leads me you, to you, gold. Where, where are you at with gold? Let me, let me, before we go to gold, let me touch on one point real quick because um, – if, if you haven't seen this, I'll send it to you. I'll, I'll have to go dig it up too. But it was about a year and a half ago, the IMF wrote a paper on negative rates. And I want to say the paper was 10 pages long. Probably seven pages was dedicated to explaining how they would have to pass laws to outlaw the withdrawal of cash <laughs> from the banking system. Because the only way that negative rates work is if the cash has to stay in the banking system, right? If people can withdraw and go buy, you know, precious metals or land or whatever it is, you know, then 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 it doesn't work. But uh, you know, negative rates is you can't you need to keep people from. So the thing that they haven't thought about all this, they have been thinking about this for years. And Australia, Australia just has put out their legislation to ban cash, right? They are taking right. ripping out the ATM. So yeah. uh, look what China's doing, you know. So all these changes, and again in the in the whether they use COVID as the reason to yeah. not spread germs with yeah, cash yeah. and, you know, yeah. it's going to continue. And, and when COVID eventually this too shall pass, yeah. this new mechanisms, this new regulation that it's not going to pass. It's, it's, it's the trend is your yeah. friend. It's going to stay. For never, a never so, let a crisis, never let a crisis go to waste. Right. That, that's right. So now wh where's your take on gold? So, you know, I'm kind of agnostic on gold right now. I, I, in my gut, I still think that gold's going to go lower uh, over over the next, call it six months or a year. But for as a short term, near term correction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I think we could easily back be back to seventeen hundred gold dollar gold. I don't think that would take a lot to which happen. Which is not a big correction, you know. Which, so like, which is not to, a big correction, no. Yeah. And if, if we get into some kind of a liquidating market where the dollar's really spiking, which I continue to believe is possible, maybe we see more than that. Uh, and and the, the point I want to make is for, you know, I started saying this, uh, you know, a couple of years ago that you need to be ready for a gold pullback. And it didn't really come right. You know, we just kind of ground higher. And we, then last year we kind of made a pretty big move higher. And I think we were around seventeen hundred in March. Sixteen fifty, seventeen hundred. But when we got into the liquidating market, gold fell two hundred dollars. And again, the, 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 and that's the point that I was trying to make is if we get into one of these scenarios where the dollar spikes, gold will get sold for dollars. Not because people want to sell gold, but because they have, they have to sell to. gold. They have to, right? And um, so I would expect if we get into it, and, and I think we will have, you know, I think we'll have a series of liquidating markets over the next couple of years. You know, we'll have a mini crisis. They'll do something and it'll calm down for a couple of months. And then we'll have another little crisis and it'll calm down for a few months. But when those mini, you know, mini crises is coming, dollar spikes, I think gold will get liquidated or at least have a short-term pullback. But then I also expect it to recover faster than everything else, just like it did in 2008 and just like it did uh, three months ago, right? Yep. Um, you know, the miners, I think in March, the miners fell 
And but now they're up, you know, the 100 percent from the lows or 200 percent from the lows. Um, so, you know, I expect them to get liquidated when cash is needed, but I expect them to recover very fast as well. My worry of gold running two higher is going to be a very different strategy. It's a two prong worry is, you know, being doing what I do, I'm a large financier of these deals. It's going to attract more competition from guys that just want to do fees. And, you know, you have that aspect to play with, but yeah. on another dimension is if gold does get to 22, 23, 2400, which I do believe it will eventually, you're going to have these nations start saying, wait a second, you know, wait a second, we set up these tax rates when your margins were so thin. Right. And we're going to, and if you go back historically, you always had as gold gets higher, you have step ups per ounce. Yeah. You got to yeah. pay plus taxes. I think the risks associated in this market, and look, both of us do, uh, we, we analyze the risk and, and the analysts in the industry are not pricing this appropriately. They're not discounting enough in a lot of yeah. these emerging markets and areas. And more importantly, even if you calculate that, a lot of people are using their, the prices of gold and not realizing that you're forced to sell to the yeah. one buyer of gold, like what Turkey just came on and said, we talked about yeah. that six months ago. Yeah. What, what's your take on that moving forward? Well, I just see it as a given. You know, Governments, at the end of the day, governments don't have any money of their own, right? So the way they get money is they tax their citizens and their corporations. And to your point, you know, the way they're taxed right now in a number of these uh, jurisdictions it was set when the margin, when the gold price was low and the margins were low and they needed to keep these companies alive, you know, so they gave them lower tax the rates or, yeah. uh, right. Keep the employees. But, busy. but, but, but as the gold price rises and those margins rise, but now the, but now the countries are, are in trouble and the countries need more tax revenue because they haven't managed their finances well. They're going to start to look, who can we tax? Well, the people that are making money now are the gold companies or the natural resource companies. And it's a natural place for them to go and say, okay, well, we're going to renegotiate these. And let's say, but we had a deal. And it's like, you know, in star Wars, when Darth Vader, you know, looks at Lando Calrissian and says, you know what, I'm altering the deal, you know, pray I don't alter it any further. And, yeah. and what are the, and what are they going to do? Right. So, so I think, uh, again, I don't, in a free market, things are much different, but we don't live in a free market. And I think you could argue that markets are going to become less, much less free over the next two or three years than they are now. You know, the sad part, I guess, because of mining or resources and energy, you don't learn about this like the way you do in, in other subjects, you know, the history of it. And one of my hobbies is collecting uh, mining books from, you know, 120 years ago in all these different areas. And what's interesting from basically 1900 to about 1970, the analyst, there's very few analysts who were analysts back then to today. And the ones who do will remember that uh, Canada and Australia were seen as emerging markets from a gold investor standpoint yeah. being financed yeah. in New York. So they would have up to 17 and a half percent discount rates applied to their mines being financed by Americans. Whereas in America, they had a 0% discount rate because the risk was a lot lower. And right now, the way things are being analyzed in the middle of some country run by a warlord or is in a war right now and people are worried about title has the same discount rate as something that's producing in Nevada. Yeah. So yeah. it's gone from so far left to where it used to be to where it yep. is now. I think the pendulum is definitely shifting and people aren't talking enough about these discount rates being applied to peer groups and where that's going to lead. So that comes, you know, the whole, you know, I, I used it as this swap line concept and showing where yeah. the financing is and where the production is coming and all that and to understand the risk better because I got to say after 17 years, I've never seen that something in Kazakhstan is getting the same discount rate as something producing in Ontario or yeah. Quebec or Nevada. It's just like, mm, have you been to those places? Like, right. are you, are, you know, it's just like, what are you doing? You know, but I, I don't know. Do you see a change to that after more minds? No, get I mean, no, I mean, I think I, I, like I said, I, unfortunately, I think the world is becoming less free, not more free. Um, I think the world is headed towards more conflict, not less conflict. And some of the, some of that conflict will be internal. Some of it will be, you know, between nations. Uh, but you know, this is, uh, 
you know, I think you've read the book, The Fourth Turning. That that book has influenced me as much as any book I've ever read. Now, whether we're just starting The Fourth Turning or halfway through The Fourth Turning or near the end of The Fourth Turning, I don't know, but we're somewhere in there, I think. And, you know, you know, positive things don't really happen in The Fourth Turning. <laughs> you know, oh, for a number of negative. That was a great yeah. book. Yeah, and it's yeah. something we should recommend everyone who has already. Absolutely. But it had more of an influence on you than The Colder War? Well, you know, we got to keep it in perspective, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, I brought yeah, up. So I, so, yeah, so I, 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 long story short, I think all of this stuff, you know, we're going to have less free markets. We're going to have more government intervention. Um, you know, government's going to come after your wallet, whether you live in, you, you know, California, Nevada, Vancouver, or Guinea Bissau, right? Yep. <laughs> so we talked about oil, and you were spot on, and I don't think any of us thought oil would go negative to the extent it did, even though in 2014 there were pockets of areas that it did go negative, but that was shocking and it was short term. Yeah. And But you talked about these areas where it's gonna go way below the cost of production, but also you talked about, so you were spot on there, give credit where credit's due. Yeah. Um, do you see, and, and you know my stance on oil, I was like, I don't see it taking off anytime soon. Yeah. Is there anything that gives you reason that you were gonna see $75, $80 oil anytime soon? The, the only reason would be is if, you know, the military conflict breaks out and, you know, supply lines are either cut or disrupted. So and, straight up or moves where you right, know, one third right. of seaborne oil shuts you know, down. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. You know, but short of that, see, I don't, I don't think that the global economy is accelerating. In fact, I think it's decelerating and a decelerating economy, you need less energy. Um, you know, but the, the frackers have to keep pumping because they, you know, matter, even if their margins are negative, they're going to make up it on volume, right? And so I think that, you know, I, I, I think, yeah, yeah. Suncor, which is Canada's largest producer, just came out with their numbers on their new Fort Hills project. It's a massive, massive tens of billions of dollar capex. And they've done everything they can to reduce their costs. And they say we have to move forward with it. And it's yeah. still their costs are higher than what oil is selling for. And they've made this commitment moving forward. And I'm sure there's a multiple approach, their cost of capital versus sure. cut to kill their competitors to take market share. They're looking kind of like MMT, debt is an investment. They're looking yeah. at a loss as an investment moving forward. So we're seeing a lot of that in the sector. So we're on the same page there for oil, but what about copper? You you really thought copper would yeah. you know take it on the chin? Um, well, I still think it will. I, I still think it will. Again, and- What time frame? That's a tough one. I would say over the next nine months. I, I really think so nine to twelve months. Yeah, over the next nine to twelve months, I would I would expect us to be back down to where we are. It, we're in March in the next nine to twelve months, uh, and the reason I say that is I I think I think all markets are going to the risk on markets have been pumping since April, right? Uh, once the central banks came out and started uh, stimulating. Um, I think we're due for a rollover of that. I think likely it happens in Q4, but it might take as long as, you know, early next year um, but for a couple of reasons. One, I, th I think Q4 is just there's just so many negative potential negative catalysts in Q4 that I think at least one of them will hit. And I think that'll take equity markets down, risk markets down. And I think that takes the commodity markets down with them. If we somehow get through Q4 without any um, craziness. I do think that Q3 numbers, we've only got two more weeks of, of, of the third quarter, right? So Q3, unless something really happens crazy in the next two weeks, then third quarter earnings will probably be okay. But I don't think Q4 earnings are gonna be nearly as good as you know Q2 and Q3. And those will start getting reported in January. So if we don't have a pullback in Q4, then I would expect the pullback to start in Q1 when the Q4 earnings start getting released. So. I, I expect a pullback. In Let me play in out a scenario. Yeah. Let me play out a scenario. It doesn't matter who wins the election in this framework. Yeah. Stimulation, uh, stimulus is coming. Yeah. Money pumping is coming. And with that infrastructure bill would be the easiest bill to pass regardless yeah. who wins, right? It, everyone yeah. wins in that from a political standpoint, creating jobs and all that. By the time that actually hits the market and goes through, call it 18 months post-election when the stimulus programs actually hit the real yeah. markets for the purchases and after all the approvals and all that. But the market would be forward thinking to that, preparing for, do you not think copper and some of the base metals would benefit from such a thing? Or are you saying it, it, regardless? 
Well, I, I think we're going to have another liquidating type market. So I think in the very short term, they will get liquidated. It's probably going to be a fantastic op buying opportunity for all the reasons you just pointed out. They are going to spend. They are going to do infrastructure programs. They're going to do them all over the world. Um, now, w what that means in various currencies, that, that's open for interpretation. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if we get another sell off like we had in the spring, it's probably not a bad idea to start buying some of these, you know, these base metals or industrial metals because there is going to be, to your point, you know, huge stimulus plans and they're going to spend a lot of money. Now, what that means in real terms, again, uh, we're going to have to wait and see. But um, I, I've always said that the, the, the spiking dollar sets up the falling dollar, right? So my thesis on the dollar getting higher is really one of supply of demand on the dollar. And as there's less supply, the, I think the dollar is going to spike. That's going to push other prices down. Uh, but when that happens, it's going to kill the supply of those commodities as well. You know, and so then you buy those commodities cheap. And as the supply, uh, you know, isn't able to get ramped up as quickly as they would like, then those things. And as the dollar comes back down, then those commodities are going to go up. So, you know, the dollar trade really sets up the commodity trade, in my opinion. So who wins the election November 3rd? I think Trump wins. Um, I, I won't be shocked if he doesn't. So in 2016, I thought I, I had a very strong feeling that Trump was going to win. Um, and, and, uh, and he did. And, and he won in fairly dramatic fashion. Um, I think do, do you think this I'm is going to be like 2000 where it was uh, yeah, contested yeah. and it's going to drag I think, out for weeks? I think it will absolutely be contested. And that's kind of a popular view. Um, there's no, no unique insight on my part here. Um, I just can't see either side just saying, OK, no problem. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's highly unlikely that that happens. Um, I think you will see civil disobedience, put it politely, regardless uh, of which side. Um, I actually think the civil disobedience and the rioting would be worse if Trump wins than vice versa. But I, if Trump loses, I don't expect him to just go quietly either. Um, I don't expect Biden to go quietly and I don't expect Trump to go quietly. So but what about either the price of gold? Does it benefit more from Biden or Trump or the because who knows? Biden might not even get to the uh, election date, yeah. how, you know, some things. But if it's a Democrat or Republican victory, I would um, say initially, init I would say initially, if Biden won, it would be better for gold. And if Trump won, it would be worse for gold, at least initially over the next year. I don't think it really matters. But over. Uh, in the first two or three months after the election, I think I'd Biden would be better for gold. I yeah. agree with that. Yeah. Okay. So what about, you know, when you look at uh, the geopolitical risks globally, like, are you shorting other countries that you can talk about? Like Canada to me is yeah. not in a good place. And I'm a Canadian, uh, yeah. proud to be a Canadian. I, I run a good business here in Vancouver. Yeah. I'm all on shore. But I'm looking around and going, this doesn't make sense. I'm still the only guy in my building. My parking lot's empty. Yeah. Um, so is it, are you still really focused on Canada and the, the provincial debts? Or are you, are you looking elsewhere? Or Canada's even worse than you thought well, it would I be? I think, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's kind of even worse than I thought it would be. I mean, it's amazing. These programs and these policies that are being put in place and the it's, idea it's, that it's all going to work is just, it's just, it's really amazing. It's really amazing. But I think Canada and Australia are pretty similar. Um, I continue to think China is doing much worse than advertised. And I think Hong Kong is on the precipice of, you know, the uh, currency collapse. Uh, I think the Hong Kong currency peg will break. Uh, the other uh, country that I that we have a focus is Turkey. We think Turkey is uh, probably other than Hong Kong is probably the most likely to, to fall uh, from a currency standpoint. You know what's interesting about your comment there on Turkey? You saw that full op-ed that they did in the in the, the Bloomberg with that whole Q and A with their finance minister. And you sit there and going, "Man, they're trying hard to be friendly with America here." So, you know, they're talking about the development of their offshore oil yep. and then their gas and their and their gold mines and what they're planning on. And the, in the line that I thought was wild is internally they're applying a five percent growth rate year over year, year for their economy. And I'm sitting there going, yeah, wow, you know, that's pretty ambitious. So, yeah. you know, you sit there and it's just like, I wonder if the same guy who did his math did the Canadian math for Trudeau, well, right? So, yeah, it's just, it's, it's just, it's, yeah, I mean, you know, when you, you look at these government projections and the revenue is always going up and the costs are always going down and it's just, it's like a first grader did it, you know? Um, and the fact that they actually say this stuff with a straight face is, you, you kind of have to respect the, the the hubris of it all the because audacity. it's 
but the audacity, right? The audacity for somebody to go out there and actually say that and believe it. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's really, it's just kind of sad to be honest. I mean, right nobody's now, seriously, what, nobody's what seriously. Your those most com if I said, Brent, I need an idea. What's your number one conviction trade right now on the long side? And what is your biggest short right now? I'm just trying to get gauge where you're at. Uh, my biggest short is the Hong Kong dollar. Um, I think that's the I think that's the most asymmetric trade in the world right now. Is is banking on the the peg to break. Um, so uh, other than that, I'd say the Turkish lira um, and, and the Turkish economy itself. Turkish lira like, shorting shorting the lira. Short shorting the lira and shorting the economy. Um, and what's, you know, the equities. When, and what's your number one long like conviction? Just buy this and it's gonna. Wow, that's a really tough one. Probably, well, over what time period? Let's say if you can stomach a 12 month hold for 12 months, it could go up and down, but in 12 months, you believe it's going to be a lot higher than it is today. God, 12 months. Which is like I'd nothing. That's short term. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'd probably say Amazon, which is crazy. Um, you know, but I just, that's a company that's not going anywhere. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be around for, for years to come and they're going to take market share and, so if I had to just pick one, or you know what, I, I'd probably say something like Philip Morris. I'll, I'll say Philip Morris, because it, it, that can weather anything. That oh, people aren't going to stop smoking. That's from vices. <laughs> yeah, people aren't going to stop smoking. And I've said that before, but I really do think that we're going to get in an environment where people and investors around the world are going to buy big American blue chip companies that pay a dividend and that can have a good balance sheet and can withstand a recession. And I think Philip Morris, and you know, I'm, I'm a little biased. I used to work at Philip Morris years ago. And so I saw how it was run and I saw their profit margins and I saw um, how smart they were. Um, you know, regardless of what you think of their product, you know, I'm, I'm of the opinion that adults can make their own decisions. And I just think that they are in a, a position that they have a recession proof product and people are always gonna need to eat and people are always gonna probably smoke and they kind of dominate in those two areas. So um, I'll go, with, I'll go with Philip Morris. Now, what about your take on COVID and where, where you see this? Cause I look at this fall and you know, I, I know back from my teaching days, I phoned up a couple of my old buddies and I said, you know, yep. what's it like? And he says, they are absolutely freaked out because they don't even know what to expect. Like nobody knows. And they're worried yeah. about catching COVID to if a kid has a runny nose, what do we do with it? Is it, you know, so there's such fear out there. And I, and I just see like the implications here from, you know, from the, from the education standpoint, from the, from the social development aspects, from health aspects, you know, people are yeah. afraid to go to the hospitals. They don't want to be around other sick people, but they're preventing, preventing or getting early, prevention or, or, or treatment to something that is treatable versus getting the long-term impacts of COVID. What's your gut say here on the fall? Because that's going to have a big play in the markets too, how this all plays out. So, so I kind of have a couple thoughts on it. Um, first of all, I do believe COVID is real. I believe there is a virus that is very contagious and I think it has spread around the world. And so I don't think that this is a hoax, no. but I think it has been dramatically overstated or the impact of it has been dramatically overstated. Um, I don't think they needed to shut the global economy down because of it, but they did. And so I think the realities of the, the knock on effects of them having done it, there are so many people in power that have a vested interest, unfortunately, in COVID continuing that I don't think that they will just, and I don't want to, it's probably the right, I don't think that they can afford to have it just go away and everything be fine, right? So whether we get the second wave or not, I think they're going to do everything in their power to make sure they are seen to be preventing the second wave, if that makes sense. And so I don't think we're going back to football games and soccer matches and birthday parties anytime soon. Um, so what that means for the markets, I don't think that means good things for the markets, right? I think that probably means more uh, more uncertainty. Markets don't like uncertainty. Uh, you know, the markets have climbed this wall of worry on the idea that we're going to have this vaccine and everything's going to go back to normal. And I just think even in a best case scenario, if we get the vaccine, you know, and everything goes back to normal, I think that's 12 to 18 months away in a best case scenario. So I don't think, you know, come Thanksgiving time, it's, you know, all sunshine and roses. So from our last discussion about six months ago, what would be the number one thing that you learned that 
you didn't contemplate in your framework going, wow, you know, I, I didn't see that happening or yeah. was it the amount of stimulus or what, what was the one thing that yeah. you were most So the one, by? the one thing we missed was we, we weren't surprised by the stimulus. We weren't surprised by the amounts. Uh, we weren't surprised by the reactions, the, but the thing that we missed was there, cause there was such incredible dollar demand. We basically had a run on the dollar in March. People were selling everything they could to get dollars. Um, and so we knew that the Fed would come in to try to counteract that and increase supply or the illusion of supply, however you want to say that. Um, but what we missed was the amount of deferment of dollar demand. So when inventory is not getting shipped, you don't pay the invoice for that inventory. The demand is still there, but it's been pushed off. It's deferred. Uh, people didn't have to pay rent. You know, in some cases they still don't have to pay rent. Uh, people didn't have to pay their mortgage. Um, you know, uh, a number of businesses got these, 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 these loans from, um, the, the government, the, these programs, and, and they didn't have to pay their bills right away. So they had a, they, we had increased supply, but demand was pushed off. Now, the, and so that had a huge impact, right? We knew that they would try to counteract the, the, the lack of supply. What we did not anticipate was their ability to push the demand off, call it six or 12 months. And, you know, I, th I think when the economy opens back up or when these deferments can no longer go, this demand for dollars is going to come rushing back. But they did a very good job of delaying it. And that I'd say that's what we missed. In hindsight, we should have thought of that and we didn't. Hey, it's, uh, you've done great. Uh, the, the, the one aspect that I see is the time frame. You know, your time frame is three to four years and, and people will comment, they might watch this video and they'll think, what is he talking about? Today, the dollar went down this much. Yeah. You have to look at currencies in a longer term trend. Yeah. Where you see the Euro with what's going on with the pound right now with Brexit, uh, were you surprised with how the Euros responded during this whole crisis? Well, sort of, yeah. I mean, the, the, it, it kind of surprises me the, I don't want gullibility, that's not the right way to say it, but the the, the, the extent the to which acceptance. people, the acceptance of <laughs> yeah. the narrative, the acceptance of the narrative, mind. you know, you know, this idea, since the Euro was announced and, you know, the idea of it was, is, you know, 20 years ago, um, you know, the whole goal has been the, the reunification of Europe and, you know, we're going to, the federalization of Europe and it just, it just hasn't happened. But every six months, they, they, they float this idea that, oh, now we're really going to do it. And every six months, everybody believes them. And it's just it's, it's, it's Lucy pulling the football away and it will get pulled away again. Um, you know, you know, so the Euro has had this huge run on this this latest program that they've floated about. Uh, they're going to issue this common debt and everybody's going to pay into it. And it's going, you know, that is the next step towards an actual currency union or not just a currency union, but a fiscal union. But the interesting thing is that these loans, even if they ever come to fruition, don't even come for like another 12 or 18 months. You know, Spain's going to need it in 18 days <laughs> or, well, think or, 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 get, or 18 weeks, they didn't get right? The tour, but Spain, Italy, Greece, they didn't get that no. tourist injection. Right. And that's a right. huge thing that, right. you know, is the wild card on this one. So I, I exactly. have to say I was surprised how the Euro is yeah. done. Yeah. Um, so, well, you know, the other thing I'd say is, the thing that I always find a little bit, uh, it, I, run, I don't know if ironic is the, the right word, but I just have to chuckle because you, typically the people who don't like my thesis the most are the people in gold. And again, I love gold. I, gold is going to save so many people. So everybody should own gold. Um, I happen to think it'll work differently than most people, but I still think you should own it. But people have been willing to have anywhere from five to 10 to 15 to some cases, 50% of their portfolio in gold or gold miners and hold it for- It'd be one thing if they were in miners, some have it in exploration fantasies. <laughs> well, there you go. But but they're willing to hold it for five or 10 years because when the payoff comes, it is gonna be so astronomical, it's worth it. And I actually don't have a problem with that. That's the alligator, right? You buy it, you hold it, and someday it'll pay off. I don't have a problem with that, but but I have to laugh when somebody then criticizes me because it hasn't paid off in a year or six months or three months. I'm like, why does somebody else get to allocate 50% of their portfolio 
that's something that hasn't paid off in 10 years, but I can't allocate five or 10% of a portfolio for the same thing. I'm because the, because the, the payoff is the same. The asymmetry is the same. That's and why I'm just wrong, ignore the peanut wrong, gallery. Yeah, but I, I just, I just, I always say, I, I find it funny. That's part of the reason why, you know, I know you and I have a different opinion on how to, how to interact over Twitter, but I, I, I have tried, you know, a little humor and a little sarcasm and a little trash talk, for lack of a better word, as a way to potentially, hopefully, open a few people's eyes and make them think about things a little differently. So anyway, to, if that's helped anybody, I hope so. And if not, well, I guess that's the way it goes. My take on that is I just don't like guys who think they're big, tough guys online. But when they're at a conference, they weasel in the corner and are, you know, yeah. listening well, to your fair. stock picks. That's um, now, what about, you know, what would be the one wild card for the next 12 months or six to 12 months? Let's say post-election that yeah. you think that is such a wild card people aren't even talking about. But it's something that you and your team are looking at or potentially talking about. Such well, like a black swan, no one really knows, but. I, this is not a prediction, but I, this is something that I could see happening that absolutely nobody thinks can happen other than the few people that I've talked to about. And that is that everybody thinks that Donald Trump wants a weak dollar and that, you know, he wants a weak dollar because he wants to build up our exports and make us a manufacturing base again. But if he gets another mandate, I could see him going around and just, you know, negotiating hard as hell and saying, you know what? I don't want a weak dollar. I actually want a strong dollar. You guys want to play tough? Let's play tough. I'm going to let the dollar go up 10%. Let's see how you guys deal with that. You know, France, you want to sell your cars here or you want to sell your wine here? I'm going to put tariffs on you. Yep. Germany, you want to sell BMWs here? I'm going to put tariffs on you. You know, and I, so I could see him actually, you know, using the dollar as a rather weapon. than rather as a weapon and, and just verbally stating it yep. right um you know he he's he talked to the dollar down a lot over the last couple of years but then there's also been times where he's he's come out and say listen the dollar's strong because we're better than the rest of the world we're doing better than the rest of the world and if anyone's going to pivot it's going to be trump right he's yeah. not yeah. married to any ideology yeah yeah. So, and again, that, that's not a prediction, but it would not shock me at all to see him do that, especially once he gets past the election. Well, one thing I get a lot of comments on is, Marin, how come you never talk about crypto? Well, I'm not a crypto yeah. expert and I'll never pretend. And I've put a lot of money with someone who I, yeah. you know, manages my crypto allocation, but a uh, yeah. mutual friend of ours. Uh, yeah. What's your take there? Like in your fund, do you play crypto or, do, you know, what's your... We don't, play it in the, we, we don't play it in the fund, but I think everybody should. If you can afford to own some Bitcoin and some crypto, I think you should do it. Um, I, this is this is an area that's it's not going. The genie's out of the bottle. It's too powerful that it's just going to be go away now. And, and I'm kind of one of these, I guess, Bitcoin maximalist is the way to say it. Like if 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 digital currencies are going to survive, I think Bitcoin is as well. I doubt that Bitcoin's going to go away and we're going to have all these other cryptocurrencies that are that are working. It's possible, but I just don't see it that way. So I think if you can own Bitcoin, that's fantastic. I don't think that you should own it instead of gold. I think you should own it in addition to gold. Uh, I don't think it's going to become a national currency. Um, I think it could So be. Let, let's break it down for someone. Let's just yeah. say someone buys 10 grand worth of uh, gold bullion just to put, yeah. you know, they yeah. want for the family. How, yeah. What ratio of Bitcoin or crypto, whether it's, you know, you know, I'm assuming people will start Bitcoin because it's, it's yeah. the you know, the gold standard in it, but yeah. would it be half of bullion? Would it be, I think 25? it'd be half of, I think it'd be 25 to 50% of your bullion allocation. Let's just pretend mm -hmm. for an example that you have 15% of your allocation in gold or even 20% of your allocation in gold, you know, five, 5% 5 in Bitcoin or maybe 10% would be okay. That's a lot, but it's possible. Um, and, but the reason is, is because the asymmetry in, in Bitcoin is higher than the asymmetry in gold. Again, I think gold's going to do fantastic. Gold's going to go to at least five thousand dollars, probably higher than that. So that's a two or three x. Maybe even if it goes up ten times from here, you know, that would be gold's at you know twenty five thousand dollars. That's a hell of a return, right? Well, one Bitcoin thing I want to thank you for. Yeah. One thing I want to thank you for was in the depths of the crash. I had all my fundamental analysis and all that. But one thing I'm not an expert on is charts. 
and I had you and a couple of other guys whose opinion I respect on that. And I said, and you sat there with me, and I think it was like a Friday or Saturday night for an hour and a half. And I said, what about this company? So I did all the charts, and that really helped my process to how low things could go because you have your fundamental value, then you have you know where, where things go. So I always wanted to, I, I think I did thank you, but I want people to recognize yeah. you know, uh, what value add you were to me and my subscribers. And that was a great, because uh, it was such a profitable period to be prepared when that opportunity arises, whether it's luck or whatever you want to call it. But yeah. um, you know, I think what you're doing is great. Um, what would be the last question I have for you that a bunch of people I put on Twitter what would be the last book other than Fourth Turning to recommend and The Colder War would be that people need to read that really got you going, wow, like that really impacted my 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 outlook or my analysis approach from an not necessarily but from an investing standpoint or you know that helps your investing standpoint. Yeah, I'm trying to think of an of an individual book that I read. Um you know, there's there's so many there's so many I, I read so much research and I read so many, you know, blogs and I read so many just articles um, that I haven't like sat down and read a really, really good book for a long time. Uh, but one that I would say that I think is good is if nobody's ever read it before is The Sovereign Individual um, or I can't remember if it's The Sovereign Individual or The Sovereign Investor. And, and it basically it just talks about kind of how to build a long term portfolio and how to think of yourself as a sovereign nation and kind of treat yourself as a as a, as a as a sovereign unto yourself. I know I'm kind of I'm kind of repeating myself here, but that kind of put everything in perspective from a long term perspective of the types of things you should be thinking about um, and taking, you know, being in a position there where you can take care of yourself, where you don't have to you don't have to worry about what the government program is, is because if they don't supply it for you, you can supply it for yourself. Right. And, and sadly, setting your, I think, I, sadly, I think the opposite has resulted because of what's happened. Right. I think people have come to depend right. on the government more so than any point in my adult career. I don't know what your opinion yeah. is, but yeah. it's been where I've seen people that I know who have jobs and they're relying on government to defer their mortgages. Well, maybe you shouldn't own that mortgage, right? right. But that, that, right. that question is like, no, 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 I'm entitled to that mortgage and the government's going to help me. It's, it's this ideological shift that I never saw come in and be accepted in, in, yeah. in and I don't know, I doubt Canada is any different than Australia or in America or what's going on yeah. in Europe, but man, th things have really, the, the reliance on the government has been a big shocker that I've seen and people are appreciative and feeling that that's the government's duty to do it where, you know, from where we come from on the, the sound money and, and, and take care of yourself. Uh, we're, we're ending up going to have to pay more taxes for all this. So it's it's an interesting ideological yeah. shift that's happening. I think yeah. it's, it's just going to be, I don't know, do you see that changing anytime soon? Like, I, you know, they've already extended it out for three months for the mortgage deferment. Yeah. It's probably another six months. Like, where yeah. do you see this ending? Well, I, I think that eventually, you know, if you can defer, and you, but eventually the cash, if, if the most important thing to any business is cash flow, right? And yeah, can the government provide some of it? Yeah, but it's not the same, right? And can you can they defer investment? Yeah, but then if they defer, I'm sorry, if they defer payments, well then that bank or whoever the owner is isn't getting the cash flow, right? And so they can extend it for a little while, but I just think the 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 cash flow uh, is you know the lack of cash flow is going to result in seizing up in the markets, and I think we're due for another one of those. Um, so I, I don't think this is all going to end well because the government has the MMT spigots open or the the stimulus spigots open. Uh, you know, I, I would as, argue it's going to be the opposite. <laughs> as strange as 2020 is, uh, 2020 is, I have a feeling that 2021 will just be maybe stranger. I don't know what your take is. Do you see things getting normal in 2021 or do you see it? No, I, it's hard to say it would be any crazier than 2020 has already been. Just think of all the crazy stuff that that's happened. I mean, here's a, th I was just, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day who's from Australia. He grew up in Australia, he lives in New York now, but he was talking about, remember the wildfires in January in, in, in Australia, they were just like yeah. the worst fires in a hundred years. And now that seems like centuries ago, like so much has happened yeah. since then. Um, you know, that's almost like a back page story at this point. 
Vancouver is totally covered right now. This, the, they've advised everyone to stay uh, away from going outdoors because the Washington State fires, it was 300,000 acres of, of, of timber forest was burned in one day. Like that's never happened before, or at least in the, what they said, it was the worst fire in days. Uh, California's hit over 2 million acres. I believe they've yeah. had the worst fires in record for lost yeah. acreage. Um, yeah, we had uh, it, two days ago here in San Francisco. It was it was dark. The street lights stayed on all day. It was a uh, orange skies and dark at one one o'clock in the afternoon. It was it was it was apocalyptic. <laughs> See, so all those guys shorting Tesla, they could just sit sleep in their Tesla and they yeah, have their air exactly. filtered, right? See, exactly. Elon planned exactly. it all out. Anyway, yeah, buddy, yeah. thanks so much for making time on this. Cool. Uh, it's always a pleasure, and I always look forward to chatting. You stay healthy. Yeah, you too, man.